Okay, well, let's go ahead and get into the next uh, theme of our Gilded Age presentation, and that's the New South and the West. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a weird situation because um, uh, we're talking about the end of the 19th century, and yet this chapter kind of deals with uh, things that happened either during or before the Civil War. And so what we want to do here is you want to look at this uh, element as an examination of how these two sections of the uh, United States geographically, the South and the West, finally get truly incorporated into what we call the, the transcontinental American reality. And so that, that sort of um, almost physical divide that separated North and South and West and East uh, gets starts to get removed in the Gilded Age. And so we really want to take a look and, and, and uh, examine what exactly happened there. So we start with something called the New South. And this was something that was actually... Uh, coined by uh, Henry Grady in, a, in an article that he had written for the Atlantic Constitution. And in it, he basically called on the South to basically let go of all of the states' rights issues that govern economic realities. So uh, you may recall that in the um, uh, antebellum period, Southerners uh, routinely fought against federal funding for internal improvement projects, uh, what we would call infrastructure projects or public works today. And they would also be against uh, tariffs. So the government imposing really high tariffs, what they refer to as protective tariffs, the South was almost uniformly and perpetually against such moves. And it really sort of uh, gridlocked the government in, in these respects. And so uh, they also uh, challenged the validity of, of having a national bank. And so uh, Grady basically comes forward. He says, you know what? Look, uh, we got to drop all of that because if the South is ever to recover, we're going to have to start behaving like the North economically. And, and, and so b basically what's happening is there's there are social sociologists and historians from the South who are essentially trying to figure out why it is that this great noble cause that they had failed. And and what they what some come to realize is that the North really won not because they're noble and not because they're great and not because they're powerful, but but really because they're economically powerful. Right? They had enough money uh, to sustain themselves through the conflict and just continue to pour more men and material after the South. And so the idea here was meant to improve the economy without losing white supremacy. These were so, the so-called redeemers or bourbon redeemers. And these were uh, whites who were willing to kind of hang back uh, and, and more importantly to come forward and to appear as though they're wanting to reconstruct the union. And by focusing on the economics, um, they were less threatening uh, I think is a great way to put it. And so uh, these industries that start to happen in the South are things like textiles. So you may recall that in the early industrial period, end of the, uh, excuse me, the beginning of the 1800s, uh, New England became the hub of the textile industry. And so uh, this created a dilemma for Southerners because while they grew the cotton, the more value-added product of textiles was actually being made in the North. So um, the Southern states and Southern uh, interests are going to lure uh, New England textile companies to move production to the South. And they're going to do this through cheap labor and... Um, and this is and, and proximity to the source, meaning the cotton, as a way of protecting themselves from uh, sort of northern dependency. Uh, the tobacco industry has been existing, obviously, since the colonial period, right? Since John Rolfe demonstrated that he could make a commercial, uh, commercially viable uh, crop of tobacco back in was 1620s or something like that. Um, 16 teens. And uh, so it's always been a Southern thing. 
what's going to happen is a gentleman by the name of Duke is going to come up with a way of mass producing cigarettes. So uh, prior to that, um, cigarettes had to be hand rolled and he's going to come up with a machine that will actually do that for you. And uh, you may recognize the name from the university in, in Northern California, uh, no, excuse me, Northern uh, Carolina uh, that bears his name. And so um, in addition to that is the coal industry. This is mostly in what we refer to collectively as the Appalachia or Appalachia region of the United States. So uh, Kentucky, Eastern Tennessee, Southeast Ohio, Southwest uh, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia are the main places. There will also be places in uh, northern Mississippi, northern Alabama, but predominantly in these areas. Coal, because of the steam-powered engines that are now uh, leading the um, energy source for uh, the United States and, and the world for that matter, is going to make coal a very profitable industry. And um, uh, the cheaper version of coal or this, the, uh, the cheaper um, means of extracting coal are going to become very profitable things to do. So the problem for the failings of the New South and this concept of let's, let's create this vibrant economic New South based on white supremacy is that commodity prices drop pretty significantly after the Civil War. Demand's just not there. Britain and France uh, during the Civil War fall, found or created alternative sources for their cotton. And so uh, a variety of things have happened to create something to force Southern agriculture to be less, a little less productive. Because so many Southerners, white and black, had an inability to get their hands on capital after the Civil War, there had to be created some kind of alternative financing in order to keep agricultural production going forward. And this is when we get to the crop lien system. And basically what it was is a merchant or a landowner would simply provide tools, fertilizer, seed uh, to a farmer and they would sign an agreement of debt and when the crops were harvested, uh, the farmer would simply reap whatever profits they could, pay off the lien, and uh, then they would realize whatever profits, or net profits, I should say, uh, after that. And um, now, these were small farm owners and also sharecroppers, which, which were usually black. And, uh, and white, white, one, uh, white, Sharecroppers usually referred to as share tenants. They would actually rent the land from the landowner and then generate. Sharecropping was when you didn't get to own the land or rent the land, but you got to work it and then simply gave the crops to the landowner and you would share in the profits of that, of that material. The problem with it is for both poor whites and African Americans, it created what we would refer to as a cycle of debt. You don't make enough to get through the season. You owe money. They forward you additional credit for the next growing season. Now you're really deeper in the hole, and it just uh, creates this very um, deep debt cycle. And for African Americans, it really is a trap because um, the oppression for African American communities in the South becomes very severe, first in the Reconstruction period, but then afterwards when, when the federal troops leave the South. Uh, you know, the, the uh, security situation for many African Americans becomes tenuous at best and violent for, in many instances. But um, while it might have seemed logical for somebody to simply pick up and move, that mobility is hampered when you are in, in, in such debt because now that could be a, a, a justification for... Um, white people to have you arrested or detained in some way and in many cases uh, to be um, brutalized. So the race in the South is exactly as you would think it is. It, it, very little has changed uh, simply because of the Civil War. In fact, a great deal of racism in the South was 
based on a resentment that uh, Southern whites had for African Americans who um, fought with the North and uh, you know created such a negative outcome for for white soldiers. So the key became to find ways. These are the Bur Burman redeemers to um, um, recreate, if you will, a quasi state of servitude for African Americans and certainly to perpetuate a second class citizen status for blacks. And so disenfranchising is the process by which we take away someone's right to vote. Now, the Constitution had been amended. Uh, the 15th Amendment said that no state could deny somebody the right to vote, particularly for African American males. And so states in the South found themselves in a predicament. They couldn't um, deny somebody the right to vote, but they had to find a way to keep them from voting. So the so-called Mississippi plan used residency in criminal records and poll taxes in order to keep people from voting. So uh, this is still a big issue in the United States. The idea should a, should a convicted felon be kept from voting, even if they've already served their punishment and are now free and back home and working and doing whatever else they can to function in society, should they be permitted to vote? And a number of states now are, in a sense, re-enfranchising uh, convicts. Well, it was very easy for a black person to get arrested in many parts of uh, the South, and so a criminal record could keep you from being able to vote. And this became a very convenient mechanism for keeping black males from, from the voting booth. Residency requirements become very easy targets because for many African Americans in this time period, literacy is, is a very big problem. And so many of them engaged in barter, but also in verbal contracts. And when they rented a property, um, they had no physical proof that they were in fact a resident of the town, county, state in which they're living. And whites could use this as an excuse to not grant voting privileges. The last is the one that became sort of the most pre prevalent, and that is the idea of taxing people to, to go to the polls. In many states, this was a property tax. Well, how many African Americans, or even poor whites for that matter, can own property? And so um, what we did is um, this became a dilemma. Because you could say, well, if you, if you didn't pay property taxes, you can't vote. But then you're going to disenfranchise a lot of poor whites. And so what southern states did in the Gilded Age is they created what were called grandfather clauses. If your grandfather could vote prior to 1865, well, then you could vote, which is a very obvious uh, conundrum created for African-American voters. Now... Um, as far as this, the, the idea then now has to become, uh, how do I create separate spheres in a reality where essentially the federal government has told me I have to acknowledge freedom for black people. And the term we use here is segregation, right? The separation of races. And we get a number of civil rights acts because essentially the 14th Amendment, which guarantees due process of law to all citizens, regardless of race, color, creed, or previous condition of servitude, still left a rather broad interpretation as to what exactly that meant. There were a series of decisions that are collectively known as the civil rights cases. And in it, the courts seemed to come to the conclusion that civil rights, as articulated in the 14th Amendment, are really rights that can be violated by governments. So, now, what that does is it creates a dilemma because what do you do with an individual, a private citizen, who violates the civil rights of another citizen? And the courts seem to say that it had to be prosecuted at a state level under criminal statute. So as an example, if I go and beat up my black neighbor, that's a violation of civil rights. 
but it's also assault and battery, which is a criminal offense. The court seem to be saying that when it comes to an individual, you have to try them in a criminal reality, not in a civil one. And so this becomes a dilemma because in all logic, where in the South are you going to find a white jury that will convict a white man for physically violating a black person? And obviously, this it just doesn't happen, right? It, it's not going to happen. And so lynchings, uh, brutalizations, uh, evictions from homes, uh, denial of voting rights, all these different things can be happening because you simply have an individual do it. Well, you have an entire group of individuals called the Ku Klux Klan and, and, and the a white league who are more than willing to go around violating the civil rights of of. Uh, black people and and now they're going to have juries and DAs and all sorts of people who are going to basically allow them to get away with murder and so in the Plessy versus Ferguson case we get the the actual court case that most historians believe gives us the justification for segregation so Plessy was a, an African-American who bought a first-class ticket in a railroad owned by Mr. Ferguson And when he got there, he was denied his seat and was instead told he had to take a first class seat in black first class or African American first class, however you want to articulate it. Uh, At the time, it was called colored uh, sections. So there was a separate train car for African American first class. He didn't want to do that. And he sued Ferguson in a civil court for violating the 14th Amendment. The Supreme Court... uh, in a, in a rather twisted bit of logic, said that uh, because there was uh, there's a limited uh, access in the sense of facilities, and um, the trains, uh, I should say the railroads' uh, interpretation was that they had to maintain a certain public standard of separating people by race because it would be too uh, disruptive and would hinder the railway company from doing what it is prescribed to do, i.e. transport people from point A to point B. And the court seemed to accept that logic and, and basically said that if a, if a community can demonstrate that separating the races is a, uh, a necessary thing and that they can provide facilities for African Americans that are considered equal in quality, that there is no violation of the 14th Amendment. Now, this becomes known as the separate but equal standard that the court establishes here. And it remains the court's position for about 50, almost 60 years. And this this becomes uh, just an obscene idea. Uh, the um, Justice Harlan who uh, writes the dissenting opinion in Plessy versus Ferguson, just comes right out and gives a very clear modern interpretation here, which is the 14th Amendment is very clear. You can't violate people's due process of law, period. Now, what's interesting is that Harlan's legal arguments against the ruling are going to be used by Thurgood Marshall when he's the attorney for the um, NAACP, when he argues in the Brown versus Board of Education case in uh, 1954, which will overturn this opinion. So separate but equal then becomes a legal justification for what we now refer to as Jim Crow. Now, Jim Crow is a name that comes from minstrel shows. He was was um, an MC uh, in a popular minstrel show. And a, a crow was a euphemism or a, a code word for a black person. goes all the way back to the colonial periods when they would talk about um, slave sales and they would talk about blackbirds for sale or crows for sale. And this was a, a, just a derogatory term for an African-American. So in the minstrel show, Jim Crow uh, was in blackface. It was a white man in blackface doing a very negative caricature about a black person 
and the humor in his role in this show was that he got the stories wrong. He, he got the news stories wrong and he got the, the, the logic incorrect or he had the words incorrect and mispronouncing, mispronunciations. There I go. And, um, and so when these laws get instituted, uh, they're going to be referred as the Jim Crow laws because they were derogatory. They were meant to put down and to demean African Americans. And so this separate but equal um, premise is going to be used for a very long period of time. At one point, mob rule actually breaks out in North Carolina. The state makes a decision not to prosecute violence against African Americans. And white mobs begin to... Uh, lynch black people all over the state. Um, it, it's it's a horrific, lesser known fact of American history. These these incidences, by the way, there was one in Louisiana and in, in New Orleans, where just dozens of black soldiers were just brutally murdered in broad daylight, and and nothing happened. I mean, nothing happens. Uh, the president at the time, uh, Ulysses Grant is actually going to threaten North, southern states to um, increase the number of Union troops sent to the region. Um, and he actually uh, gets his attorney general to prosecute uh, whites for violating the civil rights and, and criminal behavior against African Americans. In fact, it's, it's, the number is somewhere around 3,000 Southerners are going to be rounded up and, and sent to federal prisons. And so, but, but it doesn't work. It, it just doesn't work. And it's, uh, you know, a hundred years after the Civil War ends before we get any real significant movements on, on civil rights in, in the United States. So the African American response is is rather unique because uh, it's it requires a new narrative, and the reason for that is the narrative prior to the Civil War is rather straightforward: end slavery. And so th th that's that's pretty easy um, standard to meet if you you know in terms of having one goal. The problem after the Civil War, of course, is how do you empower African Americans to be able to live their lives like any other citizen of the United States. So this is the whole idea of equal protection. How do you guarantee equal protection? So um, a very powerful character or a figure in this area is Ida Wells. Now Ida Wells is interesting because she's not only African American, but she's a female and women can't vote, right? Um, and won't vote until 1920. She becomes the editor of the um, Memphis Free Speech, and and he, she leads a crusade against lynching. Essentially, she fights to make lynching a federal crime, and that's to get around these civil rights cases issues. This this idea that um, lynching would be a criminal cr a criminal issue and must be uh, prosecuted at a state level. Well, no state court's going to go after a white person for lynching a black person. So. Uh, Ida Wells leads this fight to um, make lynching a federal law, and it takes a long time. It, it takes decades to get that to happen. She becomes part of a movement that creates what's first the Niagara Movement, because of it was, the meeting was in Niagara Falls, and then leads to the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or Persons, at the NAACP. Um, now, Booker T. Washington... And W.E.B. Du Bois create a, uh, let's call it a gentle split within the African-American civil rights movement. How are we supposed to approach this issue? And I think it's important to realize that these two men came from very different beginnings. Booker T. Washington was a slave and gets liberated and is very familiar with the innate hatred and resentment of the black race by uh, 
Southern whites and is not confident that in that current environment, right, um, within uh, Booker T. Washington's contemporaries, it was not a realistic goal to call for full equality under the law. And instead, he believed that black communities should focus on creating their own vibrant uh, communities, that they should become as educated as they can. More importantly, they should be trained in skills that garner higher wages. They should create their own banks and their own schools and you know all these other uh, facilities and resources so that they themselves can create better realities for the black community. His vision or aspiration, if you will, is that eventually uh, the white society will see these parallel black communities vibrant and, and positive and productive and useful and, you know, all the other values that any American would uh, embrace and finally say, well, then why are there two? Why is there a white version and a black version? Why, why not integrate it and, and move forward as one? And now, uh, in that vein, he, cre he helps to found the Tuskegee Institute and, and other places to train African Americans in things like agriculture and mechanical engineering and other types of sciences, which is where we get the idea of a college being an A&M, right? So Texas A&M is agricultural and mechanical. And so, um, uh, now, W.E.B. Du Bois was born in Massachusetts to free parents. He's the first African-American to receive a PhD from Harvard. So he's, he's well-educated. He has very little first-hand experience with slavery or um, uh, the, the, the racial tensions that they're at the level of, of a Southern reality as opposed to New England, which, believe me, had incredible racial uh, resentment and double standards. But uh, Du Bois saw um, Washington's view as accommodating racism and accommodating um, segregation. And so he referred to it as the Atlanta Compromise because it, um, uh, Washington made a speech in Atlanta, Georgia, espousing this ideology and and so instead, he called on blacks to fight for the rights and for total equality. And so Du Bois is credited for being the leader of the Niagara movement and the, and the NAACP. And so um, he believed that the way to do this is through something he referred to as the talented 10th. He believed that about 10% of the African-American community in, in the United States uh, were educated, trained, um, you know, articulate, highly gifted, you know, this sort of thing. And it was their obligation now to, in a sense, be the point of the spear and to push through legislation to help the African-American community as a whole, but also for these, uh, this talented tends to reach back and grab the hands of the other 90% and pull them up uh, into a better existence in the United States. And this is, um, if you think about it, these two conflicting ideas, if you will, uh, still are articulated in um, uh, the civil rights movement in the United States. There are separatists and integrationists, right? So a uh, Louis Farrakhan is a, is a sort of um, uh, modern day example of a, of a clearly militant version of um, separateness, right? So the um, shift now goes to the West, and they call it the New West because the pioneer days are over, right? Uh, in 1890, the Census Bureau will basically declare that the frontier is closed, that there are no new lands in the West for settlement or claim or, or um, for that matter, exploration and, and mapping. So... Um, these new settlers started to come in, the so-called pioneers, with the Homestead Act of 1861. And it, basically, 
in the midst of the Civil War, the, the, the Union feared that open spaces not claimed were going to be vulnerable to sort of attacks. And there, and there were, right? I mean, uh, California was invaded by Southerners trying to win uh, territory, and Colorado, uh, New Mexico, right? So there were places where there were attempts by Southerners to take territory. But the other thing was the United States believed, the government, I should say, believed that there were incredible resources to be exploited in the West. And the only way to do that was to move people there. And so the the new West is essentially the idea that you're, you're you know, we're going to create a, a West that incorporates itself with the rest of the country and provides really a lot of the raw materials that the Eastern industrialists were going to turn into great products that which then get sold all over the world. So this included the Mexican Americans and Indians. And it's part of a very sad narrative. Uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848 between the United States and Mexico uh, essentially acknowledged any Mexican citizens who chose to stay in the what was referred to as the Mexican Session or California, uh, if they chose to stay after 1848, that they would automatically be considered citizens of the United States. And thousands and thousands of them do. The tragedy that seems to rear its head way too often in this country is that the rights of Mexican Americans just are not respected by the uh, the white American legal system that comes into play. It's particularly true in California during the gold rush. A, a lot of land owning um, Mexican Americans are going to see their uh, property confiscated by whites through a process called squatting, and the courts will simply back up these squatter claims. And uh, simply because the owners are Mexican, it, it, you know, there's just um, full on prejudice against against this, and uh, that's that's a, a prejudice that exists way into the 1900s, 1960s, really. For Indians. It's a perpetuation of the same old problem. Indians were not considered citizens of the United States. This was this has been an ongoing issue ever since the British landed. Um, unlike the Spanish, who saw Indians as a um, conquered peoples meant to become subjects of the Spanish crown which is basically meaning to be like any other peasant in the Spanish system. But that there's an implied citizenship there. Britain never did that, nor did the United States. Uh, Chief Justice John Marshall called Indians um, foreign entities within domestic boundaries. So Indians won't even be offered citizenship to, uh, in the United States until 1924. And so for the New West, Indians are part of this narrative, and yet... They really have no status or agency in the New West because they're considered foreigners, uh, even even on their own land. Uh, and so um, uh, there's a series of Indian uh, realities that are going to happen that uh, uh, really um, should be a shameful thing for all of us as Americans to, to, to study. So the Northern Europeans that come West... Are predominantly Germans and Scandinavians with a with a, a good dose of um, the Irish, and m now many of them are coming because of uh, social and political unrest. Uh, the Irish had come originally because of the potato famine. After the war, it changes, and it's more about the political instability created by British control of Ireland and the Irish resistance to that. So uh, Irish will continue to come to the United States, but for essentially a different reason. And so um, many of these people are coming for uh, agriculture. So um, if you go to places like Nebraska and Iowa and whatnot, you're going to see a, a, a lot of um, German and Scandinavian heritage. In the upper Midwest, Minnesota, North South Dakota, 
right? Wisconsin. Uh, there's a lot of Scandinavian immigration and a lot of Dutch immigration in there as well, particularly in places like Michigan. So um, now Chinese immigration had started in the in the gold rush on the West Coast. It's not going to be into the latter uh, um, Gilded Ages. We'll see Chinese immigration into the East Coast of the United States. In fact, when a Chinese woman uh, gets off a boat in New York City, and I believe it was 1850 something, it made the front page of the New York Times. Uh, it was such considered such an oddity, and so um, the uh, United States um, is going to exclude Chinese. If you remember from the uh, my previous lecture, the Chinese uh, Americans are the only, or I should say, the Chinese are the only ethnic group. Or nationality to be excluded from immigration by federal statute and um, it gets renewed twice it's going to be really the 1940s before any significant number of Chinese uh, citizens will be permitted to uh, to immigrate to the United States and then also in the West are, are, are I considered a rather small group of African Americans from the South who flee the South uh, to use their agricultural skills and, and knowledge to start over again in a new space. And they're referred to as the Exodusters because it was a, a mass exodus out of the South. So living in the West is, is um, not very fun. Uh, it's typically a very isolated reality because while you might, might be living in a community of some size and type, you are still very far removed from the main activity in, in the United States. In, in many parts of the West, we have what were referred to as boom towns. And these were places that get built automatically, just out of nowhere, uh, in the middle of nowhere. And they were there for mining exploitation. So a quote-unquote load, a mother load, would be discovered. And the word gets out that there's a silver, a copper, or a gold mine vein that's been discovered. And people flood in uh, to try to take advantage of it. And it lasts for a while, some longer than others. But then when the vein goes dry, or the load is over, uh, these places just basically get abandoned and become what we today refer to as ghost towns. So um, similar to that, or what we refer to, we refer to as the cattle boom. And so um, places like Texas during the Civil War proved that they could produce an incredible amount of beef. And this um, uh, draws a lot of investment into cattle ranching. And in the early Gilded Age, uh, it was necessary to drive cattle from Texas, from these... Um, ranches and to um, uh, take the cattle up into Kansas and other parts of the of the Midwest where they could be loaded onto trains and, and sent to Chicago which was the main uh, uh, base of the meat packing industry and so um, a boom occurs in this in the sense that just more and more cattle uh, get uh, get per into production, if you will, uh, in Texas and New Mexico, northern New Mexico and Arizona and Colorado, and what and this is where we get the sort of um, let's just call it the myth of the cowboy, if you will, the folklore, and uh, this culture really only existed for a short period of time because once the railroads understood that there was profits to be made for transporting beef. They simply extended the rail lines down into and into Texas cities, but um, t towns like Abilene and um, others will become very big um, uh, towns and, and cities uh, simply because they were uh, trafficking f uh, centers for um, the beef industry, and so. Um, we have innovations that happen in here. The refrigerated railroad cars, uh, Gustavus Swift and Philip Armour. So um, uh, many of you may recognize those names on uh, various cold cuts and, and uh, you know salami and things like that you, you might be buying in the grocery store. And essentially what they're doing is they're um, creating uh, 
a grocery business. It's it's um, food is no longer a just a commodity that's produced and sold. It's a business. It's an industry now, um, and uh, it's going to become a boom for many people. Uh, a similar story for this, of course, is uh, Pillsbury. Pillsbury was a guy, and I believe it, it was in Minnesota. And um, during one of the uh, panics, he he was able to take the profits that he made by providing milling service for for grains, and he took that money and bought up even more land uh, for production, and just made himself into a millionaire. That is now the Pillsbury Company, and uh, so. Homesteading, on the other hand, uh, is a part of this industry, but it's, boy, a, a, a really tough, tough, tough life. So um, these claims that were made during the um, Homestead Act uh, were, for many people, just quite simply a dream come true to put it in perspective, imagine being offered 160 acres of land for today, for maybe about like a hundred and some thousand dollars. It's just a phenomenal amount of money uh, because you, you had to, um, but then it was free. You simply paid $125 in, in a processing fee for the government for registering and getting your, your land uh, uh, legally documented. Uh, and you just had to live there for five years and develop the property. Uh, they expand that number. They they add an additional 15 acres later um, if you promise to plant trees on it. And we, we'll actually see whole areas of the country, place like Kansas and Nebraska, no trees. There were no trees. The trees that are there now are, for the most part, from the uh, Homestead Act. And so um, these lands were just considered a dream come true for many of these farmers, especially ones who were coming from Europe, where just getting any land was uh, just out of the reach of most people. But 160 acres? I mean, that's just unthought of, right? And so what happens is the homestead life is very tough. You are quite literally in the middle of nowhere. And your nearest neighbor could be literally miles and miles and miles away. It's particularly difficult for women because you could find yourself isolated from other adults, particularly adult females, um, for, for months if not years at a time. And, and this becomes rather difficult. So what happens? The um, Interior Department send uh, agents out to ensure that, in fact, the people who have the claim to the land are the people actually living it. And um, Oliver Kelly goes out west, and he's checking on these claims. And in the process, of course, he's getting to know these people, and he realizes that the, real, the, the main stumbling block for these populations is the fact that it's lonely. And it's difficult to sustain a homestead when you are literally going driven mad by what 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 one people call uh, I'm sorry one group of people called cabin fever. And if you if you grow up on the East Coast, um, we still talk about that, right? Uh, when I was a kid, they would talk about every winter, right? You get trapped inside for that long, and by March, you're just like, get me out of here, right? And that's a form of cabin fever. But for these uh, folks, this isolation was proving to be really lethal. Lots of suicides and, and people just quite literally going mad. Um, and so Kelly started an order of husbandry, which became uh, called the Grangers. And it was basically a social group. It was a way for farmers out in the homesteads to communicate with each other through newsletters and to keep up on the news of, of your neighbors and to understand what was going on in commodities businesses and the latest technology that was out there to help farmers. And what happens, of course, is um, Granger Halls start to be built. So for us in San Diego, California, you can go out to Julian and you can see a Granger Hall. These are just really just big barns. And it, people will gather there periodically during the year for social events, uh, county fairs, um, uh, uh, quilting bees, uh, 
that where women would come together with their different uh, swatches of, of um, remnant material and they would uh, create qu quilts for each other. And so all, all this is very social. However, in the process of socializing, these farming families started to realize that they shared common problems. And so the Grangers are going to evolve into a lobbyist organization for um, uh, farming issues in the United States, uh, first at the state level and then at the, at the federal level. These Granger laws are going to become uh, very important, uh, regulating railroads and uh, trying to control banks as they start to establish themselves in, in, the, um, in the New West. So for pioneer women, this was very difficult, and the Grangers were um, a big deal of it. And, and in fact, uh, when we talk about status and agency uh, for women, it increases in the West first. When many of us think that it would uh, that the obvious place for progress for for women's rights would happen in the East Coast, a place like New York or Chicago or um, you know Boston or Philadelphia, but pointed fact, uh, Wyoming is the first state to offer women the right to vote, and that's in 1869. I mean, that's a that's a significantly right that's 60 some years prior to the 19th amendment and so um and that's followed up by utah and then california so almost all of the western states will extend suffrage to women before the night before the 19th amendment is ever even considered in the in the in the, at the national level and and so it's because of these pioneer women they were they were tough they worked right along with the men uh, they were important for all sorts of reasons. And in order to attract women to the West and to keep them there, uh, the men felt that they had to offer them more status and more agency in their communities. And, and, and that's exactly what they did. But we want to remember that the, the Grangers uh, realized quickly that the railroads were kind of screwing them over. And the railroads did this because they could. Uh, and when, when the transcontinental system gets created, it really meant that large swaths of the Midwest and the West were serviced by quite literally one railroad. And that meant that if you were a homestead farmer and you wanted to get your produce to market, you only had one way of doing that. And that was by rail. And it was only one company. And the, and the railroads got you twice. They, there were two ways the railroads could get you. Um, there were shipping rates that they charged per ton. But if you were a smart farmer and wanted to hold back some of your produce so that you could wait for prices to go up a little bit before you released your, your grains, uh, you still had to find a place to store it. And the railroads created silo bins, big silo uh, structures, where they would store your grain. But then they charged you a storage rate. So um, the Granger laws get into place first in Illinois, and they went after these storage rates. And um, the uh, president of one of these uh, railroads, Munn, sued the state of Illinois in the federal courts, saying that they, it was a, a violation of his, of his rights to go to um, tell him what he can and cannot do with his company. And, and it's the Munn v. Illinois case. And the Supreme Court basically said, well, no, um, if Illinois can have a justifiable reason for regulating shipping rates, well, that's, that's fine. And in the sort of exuberance of that success, the, the state of Illinois decided, well, now let's go after uh, shipping rates. And here the court reversed itself, or I should say clarified itself. Um, the Wabash Railroad uh, sued the state of Illinois for um, uh, taxing and otherwise regulating shipping rates. And the Supreme Court sided with the Wabash Railway, Rail Line, stating that because the railroad itself crosses state lines, it is an interstate commerce, which is only under the purview of the federal government. This is going to push the Grangers to lobby at the federal level and get... Uh, what's called the Interstate Commerce Commission Act passed, uh, I want to say 1887, 
and they um, this is the first time the federal government regulates an industry, in this case the railroad industry, and creates the Interstate Commerce Commission in order to regulate railroads. And uh, unfortunately, it's really the beginning of the death knell of railroads in, in North America or in the United States, at least. So as we shift now to the fate of Indians, right? Um, so the Indian Wars result in over 50% of Indian lands being taken over by the federal government. And uh, this is done either by fighting or by treaties, which of course are just perpetually broken by the Americans. Um, and so for African Americans, uh, this is, uh, or I'm sorry, for Indians in, in the West, it's another version of, of uh, cultural extinction, which I'll talk about in a minute. The Sand Creek Massacre is a slaughter of peaceful Indians. And what happened was a group uh, basically gets attacked uh, they go after, They go out looking for these Indians. They don't find that group, but they find another group of peaceful Indians and basically decide don't care and slaughtered them. And uh, now, uh, even African Americans are going to be used to fight against Indians. And the Indians will refer to them as the Buffalo Soldiers, which are sort of immortalized in a famous reggae song uh, by Bob Marley, right? Buffalo Soldiers. And um, uh, so the pattern becomes the same. Indians are having their lands invaded by whites. When they rise up to challenge that, they're met with the full f force and, and, and defense of the, of the U.S. Army, of white militaries. And basically given the option of either settling into reservations or being annihilated. And if not annihilated, at least virtually annihilated, something called virtual extinction, right? And so um, we talk about the Great Sioux War and the death of Custer because it's uh, emblematic of really one of the most sour parts of our history. And this is the... Um, uh, virtual annihilation of, of an entire race of people, which today we would call acts of genocide. So essentially what we start with is a Sioux nation that is incredibly huge. And the problem started because American settlers going west would trek through Sioux territory. Now, their goal was to reach the, the Rocky Mountains prior to September because if they couldn't get through the mountains by October, there was no way they were going to make it. And the, the famous story of the Donner family, if you will. And so uh, what happened was those settlers who couldn't make it in time simply set up shop in Sioux territory. Some, most, are going to move on in the spring, but others are going to decide, well, why? With land right here, we could do it. Nobody seems to be using it, right? That kind of thing. And the Sioux Indians come out, go on the warpath, and go after these people. The uh, cavalry comes out to defend the whites. In negotiations, uh, referred to as the Fort Atkins Treaty, uh, or Fort Laramie Treaty, excuse me, um, the, the Indians agreed to a, a, a peace settlement wherein they would allow those settlers to go through and the um, U.S. cavalry would, 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 in a sense, guarantee the territorial integrity of the Sioux Nation. This doesn't work. Settlers violate these rules. The Sioux go in and uh, try to kick them out. And instead of living up to their side of the agreement, the American soldiers come in and defend the white settlers. Um, fighting breaks out. A, another peace settlement is made. And uh, now the Sioux give up a huge chunk of their territory so that the uh, it was called the Bozeman Trail would be completely outside of Sioux lands. This was believed to like just settle the problem. The Indian tribes leaders, the tribal leaders of there uh, basically said to them, look, you know, before we smoke the peace pipe and sign this thing, I hope you guys understand that, the, you know, the great spirit can hear you. you. You know, you keep breaking these promises, right? And Custer is one of these people in attendance. And what's now referred to as Custer's Last Stand, but what is really historically more the Battle of Little Bighorn, uh, 
Custer basically disobeys orders and he takes a small cadre of men and tries to start a surprise attack on a Sioux war path or war party, excuse me, um, in the anticipation that reinforcements are going to be coming in large numbers. He's outnumbered more than 10 to 1. And um, virtually, well, the entire unit is killed. Uh, most of them mutilated, especially Custer's body. Custer's body is mangled and shot full of arrows in the face, uh, just totally mutilated. Um, uh, but for most whites at the time, it was seen as this brutal, savage attack on civilized white people. And it's going to justify for a lot of people what we now refer to as virtual extinction of Western Indians. So uh, this comes through various methodology. And and the first, it really isn't even like a, a mindful intended thing. Um, the, the complete destruction of NATO buffalo herds is going to destroy an entire Indian way of life. Their diet, uh, their clothing, their cultural realities, spiritual realities are all very much focused on the buffalo and the maintaining of buffalo and the interaction with buffalo. So what happens is uh, buffalo skins become a fad. They become a fashion trend in the United States, in the East. Uh, buffalo coats, buffalo blankets, right? All these different things. And it also becomes this kind of popular sport to go out West and shoot buffalo. Now, mind you, uh, most of these people aren't eating the buffalo. They're not doing anything with the buffalo other than skinning the hide, chopping off the head, and you know, taking home trophies. And this decimates the herds. So what started off with multiple millions of buffalo is going to dwindle down to under a thousand within really 20, not even 30 years. It's, it's, it's an ecological and environmental disaster. And so this um, destroys the Indian way of life. Um, in the Nez Pierce story, which is on the West Coast, and mostly in Oregon and Washington, uh, Chief Joseph uh, tries not to give up any of his land. And um, when he f is pressured to do so, his um, uh, followers, the, the, the Nez Pierce, uh, flee. And they're pursued by the cavalry. Um, uh, Chief Joseph found out or learned that if he could get his tribe into Canada, that the Canadian government was being much more uh, generous and um, open to native populations. He stopped within 300 miles of the border. He's uh, and and in that we get the famous line from this spot: "From where I stand, I shall fight no more forever." And Joseph, Chief Joseph, accepts a reservation. Um, the Nez Pierce are basically um, uh, decimated. There's an attempt in the 1990s by the Nez Pierce Nation to start buying land in Oregon in order to reconstitute Nez Pierce lands. Even that, 1990s, uh, whites uh, tried to stop it uh, through legal injunctions. It's just incredible that this it gets perpetuated. And the Apache with uh, 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 Geronimo... Uh, we have, uh, you know, a guy who fights back and we get this weird narrative that we saw early in American history. This, this, this vision of native warriors as the so-called noble, noble savage, which is a very enlightenment term, right? These truly free and good people. And yet most Americans believed that Indians needed to get off their land, go into reservations and allow that land to be cultivated by whites. In a last-ditch effort to hold on to their dignity, uh, a group of Indians uh, invented something referred to as the ghost dance. And this was a spiritual exercise done by Indians to uh, reaffirm uh, Native American identity and cultural realities. And um, it was also a form of resistance. So um, one uh, prophet uh, told the dancers that if they danced, 
and they made these uh, jerseys out of uh, Indian skin, buffalo skin and Indian skin, it varied, um, that doing this dance would invoke the spirits. And, and once that happened, um, the white man's bullets w wouldn't penetrate and, and do damage. Now, as ridiculous as that sounds, whites become terrified by the dance, right? You, you can read uh, letters uh, from uh, uh, captains and other officers in the cavalry obsessing over what to do with these Indians doing a ghost dance. And it, it's, it's absurd, right, that you would feel threatened by it, and, and yet there you are. And this had tragic consequences at a place called Wounded Knee. And so a, a bunch of Indians surrendered after bitter fighting and were moved to uh, Fort in Woodendy. It is bitterly cold winter time. I believe it's in January. And um, uh, the Indians are being uh, held prisoner, basically, until they can be moved into a reservation. And they are outside. They're surrounded by uh, cavalry troops with cannon and Gatlin guns. And um, one of the Indians uh, decides to get everybody fired up with a ghost dance. And the whites freak out, right? I mean, this is ridiculous, right? And in what no one has really confirmed for sure, uh, someone's gun goes off and the cavalry opens fire and they literally mow down women, children, babies, old people. I mean, it, it's a slaughter and it is um, a blight on the American narrative that just cannot be removed. And so uh, what's going to happen, of course, is that... Um, Once the Indians are removed and their lands divvied up among white settlers, the Census Bureau declares the frontier closed. In 1893, Frederick Jackson Turner will propose what we refer to as the frontier thesis and the idea that a big part of the American psych psyche the, the collective psyche of Americans is this idea that there's always new land to go to. There's new territory, new experiences to be had farther west, farther west. And now that that's gone, there's going to be some tensions there and that at some point Americans are going to go looking for external uh, frontiers, uh, sort of a prediction of, of future American behavior. In terms of trying to reform our Indian policy, a book is published in the Gilded Age called A Century of Dishonor, and in it, Helen Hunt Jackson chronicles through a narrative about the abuses of Indians by uh, federal policy. This strikes a chord with a lot of Americans, particularly in the East, where they sort of romanticize about life in the West, and this pushes for reform, and we get something called the Dawes Severalty Act, and in it, the federal government decided that they would go into these Indian lands and they would divide them up into separate plots of land for each family of the tribe. Some people will call it the Homestead Act for Indians or the Indian Homestead Act. And so if you were a family, you got 160 acres. If you were a single adult male, you got 80 acres. And it's resisted. The Indians at first are like, look, we, we don't want to become farmers. We don't want to be ranchers. We don't want to divide our land. We, we want to be left alone. And essentially the government says, well, sorry, it's the law. So you, you, have, to, you have to do this. Um, and the lands are broken up. And these Indians became basically uh, really at the mercy of whoever the government sent to manage these uh, sales and, and, and uh, rewrites. And so some of them were very noble, although I can't see how you would call it noble when you're destroying somebody's life. But um, 
but some very cro crooked people will go in there and uh, divvy up the weakest or poorest land for the Indians and then reserve the, the, the better remnant parts that got uh, uh, surrendered to the federal government who then opened it up for, for sale. And uh, this is uh, ridiculous. And, and when the Indians um, resisted becoming farmers and ranchers, the Interior Department uh, sent officials out to say, well then, allow us to manage the land for you in the beginning of the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs. And we'll, we'll manage it. We'll lease your land out to white settlers and ranchers and farmers and, and, and then we'll, we'll hold on to this money for you. That is still today a major federal court case that goes on in perpetuity where, the, where the, our government is spending our money to try to keep Native Americans from getting this money. It's, it's, it's criminal, it's, and it's very sad reality. And so we look at the New West and the New South, and so if I'm following that same veneer of what we talked about as far as the Gilded Age, where on the surface everything looks great, but underneath there's problems, we see this very clearly. The West and the South are new. They're becoming productive and very vibrant economies. America is going to become a major agricultural and uh, industrial power based on the output from the West. However, when you go just beneath the surface, you see all kinds of problems. The violating of the civil rights of Mexican-American citizens. The outright refusal to acknowledge the rights of African-Americans. And then the open and aggressive and violent attempt to wipe out uh, an entire race of people. These are um, elements of our narrative that can't be denied and they can't be avoided. We, we, we address these things with uh, fear and trepidation, of course, and shame. And well, we should. Uh, this is a dark chapter um, in our history.